YouTube, what's up? Um, today we're looking at a two-dimensional example of the global and local stiffness matrices. So in my last video, um, I showed you, I introduced the two-dimensional stiffness matrix and how the angles come into play um, and how to use those angles to develop your local stiffness matrix. And now this video, we're going to look at how you get your global stiffness matrix and how you actually start solving uh, your system. Okay, so first of all, what we want to do is we want to start labeling our nodes and our elements and looking at our uh, local displacements for each node. So we've got our first node, bottom left corner, our second node, and our then our third node in the center, so and our fourth node up top. Okay, so at each node, since it's a two-dimensional problem, we know that there's going to be a displacement in the y direction and in the x direction for everything. All right, so you 2x. This might get a little bit messy, but just so you guys kind of get the idea. U, 4, Y, and U, 4, X. Okay, so we have our first angle, 53 degrees, and that's at our first node here, right? Looking at our node 1 to our node 3, 53 degrees, and then looking at our node number 2 to our node 3 this theta is 127 degrees alright so and we've got our three lengths of our members our L1 is 50, L2 is 50 and our L3 is 20 so the 20 is up top and our, the area um, and the modulus of elasticity is constant throughout all the beams and it's 50 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared and 200 gigapascals so this is basically the start of our problem. Um, and the first step that we want to do whenever solving problems like this, you just want to find your local stiffness matrices for each element independently. right? So if you remember from my last video, um, I kind of introduced a concept of the local stiffness matrix of a two-dimensional problem. right? So we have our co-squared, cosine. Okay, so this is the general form after all of that matrix manipulation, the transformation matrix, all that stuff, um, you're going to come up with your local stiffness matrix looking like this. So this is going to be for each element. We need to, so in this problem we have three elements so we need to find three different local stiffness matrices, right? And remember from before we have how many nodes? We have four nodes, right? Four nodes and in each node we have two degrees of freedom, right? Because we have an X component and a Y component. So multiply those and the global matrix is going to be an 8 by 8 matrix. Um, but in this problem all we need to do, like we're looking to solve for, um, let's write it out. So we need to find the displacement at node 3. And in order to do that I'll show you that you don't actually need to construct the entire 8x8 eight eight matrix, you can take a shortcut and then just jump straight to the uh, global stiffness matrix um, just for the third node and I'll show you how to do that because um, constructing the whole 8x8 eight eight matrix you don't really need to do that unless the question specifically asks for it or if your teacher wants to see it or whatever but um, in this case we're not going to do the whole thing because it'll just kind of eat up all my time. So okay, so we're looking at this local stiffness matrix this is the general form so we need to do this three times for um, are three different members. So if we start at member one, and remember this is going to be the same process every time. Label your stuff, look at your global or your local stiffness matrix, and just start punching in numbers. So our theta one is equal to 53 degrees, right? Cos of theta one and sine of theta one is equal to 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. That's simple. Okay, so now we need to start plugging this in to our local stiffness matrix. Remember, AE is always uh, is, is constant for this case because all, they're all the same, um, but the L's are different. So throw in your length of 50 meters. All right, so now we have our U1X, U1Y. And now we're standing at node number one, okay? That's where we're standing. So we want our first components of our local stiffness matrix to be 
where we are actually standing. So we're standing at u1 x and u1 y because we're standing at the first node. And now we're looking up to node number three. We're looking at node number three. Therefore, in the local stiffness matrix for our first member, we're now looking at 3x and u 3y. So don't get that confused with you know, writing 1 and 2 and, and 3. You have to look at which nodes are on the specific member. So we're starting at node number 1 and we're looking at node number 3. So write down your u1x, u1y, u3x, u3y. All right, so now we need to start filling in our values. And it's going to be symmetric matrix, so I'm just going to fill in uh, the upper triangular, and then we know that it's going to be symmetric, and it'll just reflect. So, All right, so in this case, we're looking at the first component, and we know that that's cos squared of our, of our uh, 53 degrees. So if you remember, our theta was 0 0.6, or uh, sorry, our theta was 53. Cos of that theta was 0 0.6, so it's 0 0.6 squared. And now we have 0 0.6 times 0.8, and so forth, right? So fill in the rest of the chart. Okay, so this is what your stiffness matrix, local stiffness matrix, should look like for uh, the member number one. So you can, in the next one, I'm just, I'm not going to write out every one of these uh, these values. I'm just going to write down the, the the find the final value, the end value of our stiffness matrix. So. The first step. Now the second step, looking at member two. So on member two, remember we always measure the angle from the horizontal, the x-axis, positive x-axis. So our theta here was 127 degrees, and we're looking at node three from node two. We're standing at node number two now. So don't get that confused. So we have our theta two equals 127, therefore, cos theta 2, negative 0.6, and our sine theta 2 is 0 0.8 again. So same thing, we want to plug in all of our values into our local stiffness matrix. And remember now we're looking at, we're standing at u2x, because we're at the second node, u2y, and we're looking up at the third node. So u 3y. So this is the most important step of your stiffness matrix, right? You need to just label it properly, make sure whatever node you're standing at, that's the node that goes first in your um, your displacements and the node you're looking at is the uh, second part of your stiffness matrix. Alright, so filling this in. Okay, so filling in the values, this is what we get. Um, so I didn't put in, you know, 0.6 squared like I did in the stiffness matrix one. I just put in the actual value of 0.36 and so forth. This, this was just so you guys could see where everything came from and what values we used to get um, our stiffness matrix. So uh, now we just got to do this one more time because remember we have three members, so we need three stiffness matrices, and then we can move forward with our problem. So member number three. Okay, so this one is easy because the distance, the angle between, standing at node three and the angle between um, the x-axis and our third member is 90 degrees. So that's gonna be nice and easy because we know that what cos of 90 is zero, sine of 90 is, is one, so that's awesome. So our K matrix for node, or sorry, for member three it's going to be easy. And remember now we're dealing with our length of 20 meters instead of 50 meters. So we have u 3x because we're standing at node 3 and we're looking up to node 4. So u 3x, u 3y, standing and looking at node 4, so 4x and u 4y. Alright, so anything with cos now is going to be zero. So that makes things really easy for us. So our whole first row is zero. We have sine squared, which is just one times one, so that is, is one there. And filling in the rest of the chart, this is what we get. Okay, so this is our third stiffness matrix, our third local stiffness matrix. Okay, so 
that's the first step. The first thing you want to do is find all of your local stiffness matrices for each member and make sure that you label them correctly, um, whichever one you're standing at, and then looking at and getting your angles correct. So that is basically the most important part of solving these problems is just setting up your stiffness matrices correctly. So now what we want to do, we want to look at some boundary conditions because this will start eliminating unnecessary components of our, of our global stiffness matrix. So we know that at node number four, it's a fixed support. So that's going to be equal to zero. Move, there's not going to be any movement allowed at our um, fixed support number four. So U4X is zero and U4Y is zero. Similarly, at node number two and node number one, they're pin supports, so there's not going to be any movement. So U2 is zero and U1 is zero, okay? So basically all we need to find, we know that at node number three, it's a floating node, or it's a, just a, an internal hinge. So with our applied force of our 50 kilonewtons and our 100 kilonewtons downwards, there's gonna be some movement at our third node. So those are the only non-zero um, nodal displacements, right? So let's just write that out. We know that u1x equals u2. All right, so this now simplifies things. So if we were to write out the global, the global stiffness matrix, the big one, the big poppy, u1x, u1y, u2x, u2y, 3x, u3y, u4x, and 4y. So these are eight. It's going to be the same thing. I'm not going to fill in this. Um, I'll tell you, I'll explain how to do it, but for now, we're just going to leave it blank. All right, so this is the format of the global stiffness matrix. And remember, in the two-dimensional, everything looks the same except for there's no Y components. But now we have Y components, right? And to fill in your global stiffness matrix, all you need to do is look at your first component. This is u1x, u1x, and then look at your lo local stiffness matrix, and every time you see a component, remember u1x and u1x, you look down, okay, first row, first column, you look at this guy, and you add that to wherever else you see a u1x and a u1x, and that's the only one in this case, so this would just be, what is it, 0.36, yeah. So 0 0.6 squared, so 0.36. And as you move down, you, for, for example, we'll look at this guy, U3X and U3X, right? So we're gonna find the components in this guy. So U3X and U3X, we have a 0 0.6 squared and a 0 0.36. So this is the same, right? Because we had to find the U3X u3x, u3x, and u3x again, okay? And you add that, u3x here, okay, so that's zero, so we don't need to add that one. So in this case, we have the same thing as we did in the one-dimensional problems, you just look for the matching components. Whenever they match, you add them up. So this is 0.36, and it was times two, because it's 0.36 plus 0.36. And you do that for every component in your eight by eight matrix. So you can see that it would take a little bit of time, um, so I'm not going to do that because we don't need to unless the problem specifically asks you to. So that is how you populate your stiffness matrix, your 8x8 global stiffness matrix, but we're not going to do that. Okay, so the problem specifically asks for, uh, we want the displacements at node number 3, which are the only displacements in the problem, right? So if you remember that our F equals k times displacement, right? And in this case, we have our global stiffness matrix, because this is our global force, external force, our global stiffness matrix, and that's gonna be multiplied by u1, x, u2. So this is gonna equal our, our force. 